Breach, the last phase of the internal erosion process. This presentation will provide an overview of the final internal erosion phase and of the different breach mechanisms. Overview of the internal erosion phase. Breach is the fourth and final phase of internal erosion. Fell at Hall 2015 and I Cold Bulletin 164 from 2017 refer to this phase of internal erosion as both breach initiation and breach. Breach occurs when there is uncontrolled release of impounded water through a section of the embankment in which the crest has dropped to below the impounded water level. According to FEMA 148, failure or breach is characterized by the sudden, rapid, and uncontrolled release of impounded water. FEMA P-1025 subsequently expanded the definition to include liquid-borne solids. The FEMA 148 definition is used in both ER 1110-2-1156, which is dam safety policy, and the draft EC 1165-2-218, the levy safety policy. Dam safety tends to use failure, and levy safety tends to use breach. However, in the context of this definition, they have the same meaning and can be used interchangeably. ICOLD Bulletin 164 and Best Practices in Dam and Levy Risk Analysis describe three phases in the breach process, which are illustrated on the generic breach outflow hydrograph. These phases will be discussed on the next three slides. The terminology can lead to confusion since some of the same terms are used differently for the hydraulic modeling of the breach, the internal erosion event tree, and warning and evacuation timeline for HEC life sim. The breach initiation phase, as defined in this figure, is not included in the hydraulic model. For HECRAS, breach initiation is at time equals zero on this hydrograph. Breach initiation in HECRAS is the breach event of interest for the internal erosion event tree. Beyond this time, the breach is virtually certain to form. The breach initiation phase begins with the first flow of water over or through the dam, levee, or foundation that produces observable erosion with the potential to progress and cause failure. During the breach initiation phase, the zone of active erosion is downstream from the point of hydraulic control of the flow, so outflow rate changes only in response to changes in the driving hydraulic head, not as a result of erosion. As breach initiation proceeds, the zone of active erosion generally moves upstream, such as a head cut or surface erosion during overtopping flow. The breach initiation phase ends when the active erosion front reaches the crest or upstream face of the dam, thereby producing a rapidly accelerating breach outflow and typically unstoppable failure of the dam or levee. The embankment may survive if the overtopping or seepage and leakage flow is stopped. The breach formation phase begins when erosion and outflow begin to increase rapidly, often due to a head cut reaching the upstream side of the embankment or a piping roof collapsing. During this rapid downcutting phase, the breach widens and deepens quickly. It ends when flow begins to level off and the peak flow has been released. It is unlikely that outflow and failure can be stopped. In the final phase, the breach has usually reached its full depth and continues to widen as long as a driving hydraulic head is available. Widening is accomplished through a combination of foundation and structure erosion and stability failures, which includes episodic mass wasting of the material from the banks of the developing breach. The widening can be stopped either by exhaustion of the headwater or rising of the tailwater that reduces breach inflow to non-erosive velocities. In some levee systems, widening can occur for days or months until flows subside or the breach is repaired. The end breach time in the HECRAS model can occur before the true end of the breach widening phase. The hydraulic model typically only cares about the main part of the formation and widening phase. 
If a breach initiates due to internal erosion, it usually leads to breach formation. Breach is almost certain to occur if a continuing erosion condition is expected for the filters or transitions, or there are no filters and detection and intervention has failed. Exceptions include when the water level drops below the inlet of the developing pipe before a breach mechanism has time to develop, as would be the case with reservoirs with small capacity, and then large freeboard relative to the expected deformation. For event tree analysis, the breach event must be clearly defined and understood by the risk assessment team. If breach occurs, the full breach parameters and consequence modeled are realized. In addition, the breach characteristics used in the hydraulic and consequence modeling must be consistent with the breach event for which the likelihood of occurrence was estimated. The uncontrolled release from that event must be enough to matter with respect to incremental consequences those consequences due to breach. Breach mechanisms. The following slides will describe each of the four breach mechanisms in more detail. Fell and Fry, 2007, schematically showed four breach mechanisms associated with internal erosion. These include gross enlargement of a pipe or concentrated leak, as shown in the upper left, overtopping due to crest settlement or sinkhole development in the lower left, sloughing or unraveling of the downstream face in the lower right, and slope instability in the upper right. For most embankment types and failure modes, the likelihood of breach development will be dominated by one or two of the potential breach mechanisms. Most will eventually lead to overtopping. Gross enlargement of a pipe or leak requires a continuing erosion condition where there is no self-healing. The process can only stop if the water level drops below the inlet of the developing pipe before the breach occurs or the water level drops sufficiently to reduce the hydraulic shear stress below the critical value. The photographs on the right are from ARS field testing. The videos were previously shown during the erodibility parameters presentation. As breach progresses and the reservoir drains, the roof of the internal erosion pipe will collapse. Dam break analysis typically assumes the piping roof collapses when one or two conditions occur. Erosion of the roof reaches the embankment crest profile or pre-free surface flow along the entire conduit length and the pipe diameter or width is more than twice the vertical overburden height, which is the vertical distance from the crest to the roof. The latter is illustrated by the figure on the lower right from the WinDAMP-C software documentation. The breach process for overtopping and internal erosion are described by Bruner 2014 as it relates to dam break modeling using HECRAS. The figure on the left is for an overtopping failure. Overtopping erosion and head cutting will begin to occur on the downstream side and progress through the crest. A similar process is observed locally with piping failures and globally at the advanced stages when overtopping is common. The figure on the right is for piping failure. During the piping flow process, erosion and head cutting will begin to occur on the downstream side, as shown in figure 6b, as a result of flow exiting the pipe. As the piping hole grows larger, material above the hole will begin to slough off and fall into the moving water, as shown in figure 6c. Head cutting and material sloughing processes will continue to move back towards the upstream side while the piping hole continues to grow simultaneously. This is a video of a large scale field test of a dike in the Netherlands. Small head cuts can initially form at the discharge end of the pipe, leading to bigger head cuts when the crest collapses and overtopping ensues. This is not visible in the video, but is shown in the figure at the bottom right. Here's a better look at the extents of the large scale test. At this point, the crest is lowered with the embankment collapse into the developing pipe. Next, the freeboard is exceeded on the deformed crest overlying the pipe and overtopping ensues. Here, a couple head cuts are observable as overtopping erosion continues.
and now multiple head cuts appear to have merged into one larger head cut. And here's the final breach width at the end of the video. Overtopping is the second internal erosion breach mechanism. In this example, fines are removed from a zone of internally unstable material in the embankment by suffusion, and the overlying fines move into the remnant openwork zone by internal migration, leading to caress settlement large enough to result in overtopping. Alternatively, suffusion can occur in a zone of internally unstable material in the embankment, resulting in settlement that also leads to overtopping. As previously mentioned, most breach mechanisms will eventually lead to overtopping. Overtopping can also occur due to sinkhole development. Internal migration of embankment and or foundation materials into open defects leads to stoping and development of a sinkhole or depression in the crest that drops below the water level. An open rock defect is illustrated in this figure, but as previously discussed, open defects can occur with embedded structures such as conduits, pipes, or culverts. Where the sinkhole develops is critical along with the water level at the time of the occurrence. In this example, a sinkhole at the crest is large enough to lower the crest, leading to overtopping. If a sinkhole develops at the downstream toe, it must lead to progressive slope instability and eventually overtopping. The event tree may need to consider the sinkhole location if it's not well defined by the site characterization and understanding of the foundation geology. For conduits, pipes, or culverts, the location could be informed by video inspection results. These photos are from Clearwater Dam in 2003. A 10-foot wide and 10-foot deep sinkhole formed on the upstream face at elevation 570. This followed the record pool of elevation 568. It took about two weeks for the reservoir to recede back down to elevation 560, and it took about two and a half months to recede back to normal levels. The sinkhole was probably the result of long-term intermittent internal migration of the shell and natural alluvial material into the karst foundation and more intense internal migration when the reservoir was high. Sloughing is the third internal erosion breach mechanism. For sloughing to occur, the downstream face would have to be relatively steep and the downstream shell would have to be comprised of cohesionless soil probably sandy gravel or gravelly sand, possibly with some silty fines. Increased seepage would have to discharge into the downstream shell as shown in the cross section at the bottom left for a concentrated leak in the core of a zoned embankment, or as shown in the cross section a little further to the right for an internal erosion into the foundation. The oversteepening and the progressive slumping process would have to be allowed to continue until it gradually eroded away the crest and allowed the reservoir to overtop the embankment. Sloughing is a slowly developing breach mechanism, which should take days or weeks to lead to breach. The figure on the right illustrates the progressive sloughing that occurs in a homogeneous embankment due to through seepage. It illustrates how downstream sloughing due to saturation could lead to dam failure. Some embankment dams were constructed with relatively steep downstream slopes. Such slopes may remain stable for decades as long as the phreatic line remains low on the downstream face of the dam. However, if the reservoir level rises to an unprecedented level and the lower portion of the embankment becomes more saturated, moving the phreatic line higher up on the dam face of the dam, the downstream slope may begin sloughing. This is common in sand embankments constructed by dumping or spreading the fill in which the finer outer slopes may be near the unsaturated angle of repose. In such embankments, when shallow sloughing occurs, it may concentrate flow within the embankment toward the sloughed area. If enough seepage is present within the slough, it may wash away the slough material, allowing the oversteep and scarp slough again. The process may continue in a stepwise fashion toward the reservoir until a breach is formed through the dam. These figures show sloughing due to seepage through sand levees with steep slopes. 
Sand levees without a waterside impervious layer reach steady state conditions rapidly and are prone to through seepage. Seepage exiting on the land side slope would result in high seepage forces, decreasing the stability of the slope. Through seepage has been successfully mitigated for these levees by using sufficiently wide levee sections with flat slopes, although these slopes do require maintenance during higher water events. The Bureau of Reclamation's Fontenelle Dam in Wyoming nearly breached by sloughing, but the breach process occurred slowly enough so that the reservoir water surface was able to be lowered over the span of several days and arrest the breach. A sinkhole also developed on the crest, and there may have been piping along the soil rock interface as well. Unraveling refers to the progressive removal of individual rocks by large seepage or leakage flows through a downstream rock fill zone. In reality, rock fill has a large discharge capacity, and a number of dams have survived flows greater than one cubic meter per second. Here is an example of a dam that survived large seepage flows. Construction of the 300-foot-high concrete-faced rock-filled dam on the Talkwe River in Zimbabwe began in 1989. The upstream face was being prepared for the concrete facing to be placed last. Extreme flooding occurred when the rock-fill embankment was 60% complete. The water level rose to within 5 feet of the existing crest. Floodwaters passed through the dam for two weeks without failure. The downstream rockfill slopes unraveled locally. However, construction of the rockfill continued throughout flood conditions, and as the flood receded, the rockfill was restored and repaired. Suffusion of the finer fraction of internally unstable downstream shells can increase permeability, which can lead to sloughing and unraveling of the downstream or landside face. The likelihood of breach due to unraveling can be informed by assessing the rock size to withstand a unit discharge through the rock fill as a function of slope and unit discharge using the methods of Slovak 1991 and Olivier 1967 and the revised method of EBL 2005, as shown in the figure on the right. It is suggested to use the EBL method because the Slovak Olivier method is too conservative. In the example shown for a given discharge of 0.3 cubic meters per second per meter, the mean rock size for stability is about three times as much for the Slovak Olivier method than the EBL method. Stability of the discharge face of an unreinforced rock fill slope depends in varying degree on these characteristics and conditions, listed in order of increasing importance specific gravity of the rock particles, dominant particle size of the rock fill, gradation and shape of the rock fill particles, the relative density of the rock fill, the rate of discharge, the maximum gradient, and the inclination of the downstream slope of the rock fill. The fourth and final internal erosion breach mechanism is slope instability. Internal erosion could cause high pore pressures in the foundation or embankment resulting in reduced shear strength and slope failure. Breach could occur at the failure surface, or progressive instability without intervention intersects the water surface, or a slope deformation are significant enough that the remnant slope cannot resist water load. Although it is possible, this is generally not considered to be a very likely breach mechanism for most dams. No historical failures from slope instability due to increased pore pressures in the downstream slope are known to exist and a unique set of circumstances would need to exist for it to be a major concern. The conditions making this breach mechanism more likely and less likely to occur are shown on the two cross sections. Highly plastic clays have low residual long-term shear strengths required for proper stability, and embankments constructed of these highly plastic clays require much flatter slopes. In the figure on the left, a 40-yard long by 30-yard wide slide developed on the upper downstream slope of Table Rock Dam and extended to the crest. The slide involved topsoil overlying a 35-foot thick compacted clay core. The topsoil dried and developed cracks before an extreme rainfall. The rain seeped behind and beneath the topsoil, 
ultimately causing it to collapse in a mudslide. The dam was not at risk of failure. Such slides may seem benign, but risk assessment teams must also consider their potential impacts on critical features like powerhouses at the downstream tow. In the figure on the right, the federally constructed but locally maintained Alton de Gale levee system consists of 20 to 25 foot tall levees with three to one side slopes. The highly plastic clay embankments with high shrink swell potential are conducive to deep cracks during periods of low rainfall. The cracks fill with water from rain, snow melt, and floods, which contribute to continual reduction of embankment strength from pooling within the cracks while the water is absorbed. As the clay soils in the upper portions of the embankment absorb water and gain weight, clays at and near the bottom of the embankment lose shear strength. When the embankment weight exceeds the underlying shear strengths, embankment slides occur. Numerous wedge type slides have been repaired over the years by either lime stabilization or replacing the high plasticity CH soils with low to medium plasticity soils. This table summarizes the potential breach mechanisms based on embankment dam zoning. Some breach mechanisms will not be applicable to some embankment zoning types or potential failure modes. This table applies to internal erosion through the embankment due to a crack or poorly compacted zone, internal erosion in a soil foundation, and from the embankment into the foundation. This table does not apply to potential failure modes involving open or infill defects and solution features in rock foundations because the leakage flows may exceed the capacity of even free draining rock fill. Suffusion is very unlikely to lead to the formation of a pipe through the embankment or its foundation. Therefore, gross enlargement is not applicable. Suffusion can lead to high pore pressures at the downstream tow, causing hydraulic fracturing or heave of an overlying berm. Slope instability and sloughing and unraveling are usually more critical, but there are no known cases of failure due to suffusion. Internal migration leads to stoping and sinkhole development. Gross enlargement for zoned embankments requires downstream fill that can support a roof. For breach to occur by instability of the downstream slope, the internal erosion in the foundation must increase pore pressures in the embankment, or the embankment in the foundation, so the factor of safety falls below one, and the resulting deformations must result in loss of freeboard, leading to overtopping. Sloughing requires the downstream fill of a zoned embankment to be cohesionless, and unraveling requires downstream rock fill. In summary, all four breach mechanisms lead to crest settlement and overtopping erosion. One or more of the mechanisms may occur during the breach process, and it is generally not necessary to know precisely which mechanisms would occur. Gross enlargement of a pipe or concentrated leak followed by collapse of the embankment, loss of freeboard, and overtopping is the most common mechanism. The following table from the Best Practices Manual can be used to help assess the likelihood of breach. It can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project-specific, more and less likely factors to guide subjective probability estimation. The factors in this portion of the table address the breach mechanisms of gross enlargement and sloughing and unraveling. And the factors in this portion of the table address the breach mechanisms of sinkhole development and slope instability. Toolbox Overview The breach toolbox includes worksheets for each of the different breach mechanisms. Use of the breach toolbox will be demonstrated after this presentation. The primary references used to develop this presentation are shown on the next slide. This concludes the breach presentation. Thank you for your attention.